Quel est le genre de musique qui vous donne l'impression d'être chez vous La musique, évidemment, de Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini surtout. Ça, c'est... C'est le bel canto. C'est le bel canto, justement. Maria Callas, The Divine, the Greek soprano who dominated the international opera scene in the 1950s, first performed her favorite role on November 30th, 1948, in Florence, Italy. Having done well as Wagner's Isolde and Puccini's Turandot, the role she had been waiting to pour her energy into was that of Norma, the druid priestess from an opera composed by Vincenzo Bellini in 1831. The conductor was her latest mentor, the great Tullio Serafin, and he said of her performance that night, I believe that at the end of her first Norma, Callus's impact was so great that henceforth the audience, at least in their subconscious, were changing their approach to opera. Her biographer Ann Edwards writes, In the cadenza at the end of Casa Diva, her voice made the superhuman leap from a middle F to a forte high C, stunning the audience. Then came the end of the stretta to the tria where she held for 12 beats a stupendous free high D. This was an almost unheard of feat among dramatic sopranos and those attending bravoed loudly. Another of her biographers, Ariana Stasinopoulos Huffington, tells us that Callas sung Norma 90 times in eight countries, more than she sang any other role. She sang Norma at Covent Garden on November 8, 1952. It had not been done there since 1930. Ariana Huffington writes, she evoked emotions and responses in the audience that they had never suspected were available to them. She provoked a depth and intensity of feeling that went beyond anything they had previously experienced. She made an entire audience feel more vital, more responsive, more alive. She made her American debut as Norma in Chicago on November 1st, 1954. Claudia Cassidy in the Chicago Tribune. She sang the Casa Diva in a kind of mystic dream like a goddess of the moon briefly descended. When she made her debut at the Met in New York, she did so, singing Norma. By this stage in her life, she had developed a reputation as a cold-hearted woman because of some negative reporting in the press. So it was a prejudiced audience that showed up that night. But as biographer Robert Levine tells us, by the end of the opera, the formerly cold, unsympathetic audience demanded 16 curtain calls. Dans quelle tessiture vous sentez-vous le plus à l'aise Et soprano et sûrement dans la, les tessitures, disons, de Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, évidemment. C'est là où vous vous sentez complètement oui, à l'aise Oui, c'est mon monde aussi, vous savez. C'est euh, ma manière d'exprimer que je me trouve mieux. Look at how Maria's face lights up when she mentions the bel canto composers, especially Bellini. Just watch her. Dans quelle tessiture vous sentez-vous le plus à l'aise Et soprano et sûrement dans la, les tessitures, disons, de Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini, évidemment. C'est là où vous vous sentez complètement oui, à l'aise Oui, c'est mon monde aussi, vous savez. C'est euh, ma manière d'exprimer que je me trouve mieux. That woman could sparkle with the enthusiasm of a genuine romantic. And it seems to me you're either born that way or you're not. There is an inborn grace that Maria Callas had. And it came out adorably right there as she references bel canto and the three main bel canto composers, Rossini, Donizetti, and as she said above all, Vincenzo Bellini. So what was bel canto? What was the bel canto operatic style that was popular in the early 19th century? Let's get it in her own words here. Bel canto is not beautiful singing. It is a way of yes. music, it, but it is a very hard training, good taste, which is essential. Good taste is always something that's handed down from one to the other, it's so, so called tradition. Mm -hmm. The bel canto is definitely the schooling. So if you don't have the bel canto, you cannot sing any, any opera as a matter of fact. So the opera historian Donald Grout says this about bel canto. 
it must never be forgotten in dealing with Italian opera of this period that everything depends on the singers. Robert Levine writes of Norma, the title role, in addition to being the apotheosis of bel canto, is also among the most difficult, musically and dramatically, ever written. So the singer is central. The singer of bel canto does not share contributive power with the orchestra. The orchestra is a sidekick. Indeed, there are many moments in Norma in which the singer is not accompanied at all. It is like Maria Callas says here. It is a way of, uh, shall we say, the violin playing the way the violin plays, the voice must play. Then on, you really become, or you strive to become a musician. In other words, the main instrument of the orchestra. So the vocal score in bel canto is written as though the soprano's voice has the same versatility of fluctuation as a string instrument. And we can realize that Bellini's operas require a massive talent like Callas, or they will not work. If we listen to this segment from the most famous aria of Norma, we can hear Callas' voice descend in a manner that Robert Levine tells us was referred to as a Callas string of pearls. <laughs> Levine is also keen to use this waterfall analogy to describe the fluid ease with which Maria Callas' voice maneuvers note to note. But this pertains to aria, and aria in opera is like a musically enhanced monologue. If we were talking about a monologue from a Shakespearean drama, the real time of the narrative either stands still or at least moves slower. When later on there are composers who will integrate the aria into the action, that is considered genius. It's very difficult to do. Other sections that are more communicative are like a recitative, and this is something more like dialogue. Now, Callas thought that these recitatives were very important, as she says here. Uh, when you've learned that, then you try to speak it to yourself as you have the recitative. By recitative, what do we mean? Speaking. They are the introductions to the arias. Parce que évidemment, on peut pas penser à Ozer, il faut penser au recitative que, comme vous savez, j'aime beaucoup, et les compositeurs même adoraient une fois dans le milieu. Which tells us something about this woman and why she was so attracted to bel canto. If we add this sound bite here. And the particular uh, makings of the uh, composer. If you really care to look into the music, you will always, you will always find a trill or an embellishment or a scale that justifies an expression of feeling of happiness or of, of uh, unhappiness, of uh, uneasiness, anxiety. There is always a reason for such things. What we need to serve these poor people who have made the music, who are sublime sometimes, sometimes often. And it's so difficult because there are no notes left, that is, a book to read. But we need to understand at least what the composer wanted to give them justice. So Maria Callas, it would seem, was aware of the literary value of what she was singing as well as the musical and artistic value. Norma, then, we will consider for its literary value, which is vast. Now, the character bears a circumstantial similarity with the ancient Greek Medea, the woman who murders her two children by Jason. She goes so far as to glory in this murder. Medea's impenitence can be heard in these lines in, in the play by Euripides. Jason says to her, so why did you kill them? Medea answers, to cause you pain. Norma, however, does not murder her children, whom she has borne to Polione. She secures their survival before her own death at the end of the tragedy. She has the power to watch the man who has betrayed her burn along with that woman whose affections he had left her for. She resists this temptation, admits her own fault, and her children and the other woman, Adelgisa, are spared. This is what Maria Callas said about all this. As quoted by Ariana Huffington, Maybe Norma is something like my own character. The grumbling woman who is too proud to show her real feelings and proves at the end exactly what she is. She is a woman who cannot be nasty or unjust in a situation for which she herself is fundamentally to blame. This is a remarkable interpretation, one which this video 
will share and agree with, though it is certainly open to disagreement. Indeed, I believe this is decidedly not what the modern American's first reaction would be to this opera, as we turn now to the events of the drama. In the first place, the virginal, constricting chastity vows, which are part of the culture of this Druid community in pre-Christian Gaul, receive no wink of condemnation from the narrative. The audience member must inject this for themselves, as they are free to do. But the opening scene is chock full of veneration, sanctity, tradition, as the Druids make their entrance, preparing themselves to summon the high priestess Norma with an offering of mistletoe, these moon-worshipping pagans are contained and reverent as we can hear in the music. So as we hear this, are we thinking what a bunch of old world gents? Or is this rather music of respect, esteem? Those are the emotions of this, I think. Venerating. And what I like about this opening, and what about it may have attracted Callus, is that the position of Norma is much like the life of the operatic diva, her repute precedes her to the audience. We hear of her fame. We see how she is venerated, how she is respected, and we hear of her obligations to the public, her divinity. She has the obligations almost twofold of priestess and goddess. And in the next scene, quite perfectly, we are confronted with information about her social life, her sacrilege. In the second scene, the Roman proconsul Polioni confides with his subordinate, after gratefully noting that these frontier druids have ceased their singing, relates how he's grown bored from his relationship with their venerated priestess. Next on his agenda is a lesser priestess, Adalgisa. Two things here. One, this scene presents a contrast between veneration and dereliction. Norma is both venerated and derelict. But what kind of start is Polioni off to? with the audience. With imperial arrogance, he has suborned this pagan priestess to violate the sacred laws of her own people, and with masculine indifference, he is prepared to cast her aside as though she and his children by her are nothing. He is the quintessential male bastard. This Roman officer is hustling through the sacred versions of these druids as his impulses see fit. This is why Bellini may fill the sexual revolutionary with conflicting emotions. Has he in some way led us to water? Do we feel compelled to point to this soldier and say to him, I may not agree with this culture's values, but your disrespect for them is worse. What is certain to be the case, he presents for us not just the impudence of a jaded father and husband, but an unwelcome messenger to the audience who simultaneously taints and betrays Norma before we've been introduced to her. And isn't that interesting? Before Norma even takes the stage, we see how she is exalted in the earlier scene, but we are also informed as to her true behavior. Our minds may be full of judgments about her. We have not yet met her. In the unspoken spectatorship within the room watching this, each individual audience member is having unique, distinct questions running through their minds before Norma takes the stage. We've been deliberately prejudiced, individually, before she comes onto the stage. And what will happen when she comes to the stage? She is summoned by these druids who are hoping she is going to inaugurate a war against the Romans. What are her first words? Here we are, prejudiced, privy to her personal life, aware of her obligations. Seditiosi voci, voci de guerra. Seditious voices, voices of war. And as we hear the way Callus sings it, listening to the word guerra, I believe her pronunciation of that last word, conveys a sense of disappointment. (laughs) 
She is disappointed in us. Oh, seditious voices, voices of war, how disappointing. That's what you're bringing to the altar of the gods. Those are her next words. Yours is the sacrilege, she's saying. We're looking at a person who we know to be a betrayer of virginal vows. Unashamed, she accuses these druids of the sacrilege, drawing out as she does those key words, the word meaning altar and of the gods, which we just heard. So to summarize what some of the next lines are, she basically says Rome is doomed to fall on its own. You're not going to bring it about. But then these lines are somewhat crucial and interesting. I non depende, no non depende da potere umano. Non da potere umano. She's hitting them with a hard reality that it is not within their power to assert their own freedom and to win it. That's a tough truth. But furthermore, if we listen to the way that this is being sung and we listen to the tone of the music, it does not sound at all like Norma considers this eventuality, the liberation of her people, to be a hopeful thing to be looked forward to. Neither does she ever commiserate with them over their oppression. In fact, as we play this again, I think what we will hear is that she, in fact, dreads this fall of Rome, and that what she means by the fall of Rome is the end of this relationship. Callus enunciates the word umano with a sense of hopelessness. Lonely, hopeless. Those are the two adjectives that come to mind to describe the emotions of, of those words. And then later on, something she says to them are these words, pace vintimo, peace is intimate. And I think these are great words. And what I think she is saying with peace is intimate is that the notion of peace in a psychological sense is your own obligation and your own responsibility to yourself. That when somebody else keeps the peace for you, your happiness is where you take over. It's where your responsibility begins. Peace is is an intimate thing. And the way Kala says it, you can tell she fears for her own peace. Pace vintimo are the words, but listen to the gap in what she was previously saying and this almost isolated, lonely thought that she has. Pace vintimo. Callus has enunciated the word intimate with a kind of woe is me feel. You'd be hard pressed to find something that does a better job of doubling as soliloquy, revelation, and communication. And this is all in recitative. She manages to be speaking to us, to herself, and to them, and to be revealing her lonely and desperate state of mind. But what about the concept of her clairvoyance? Does she see the future? Is she being accurate when she talks about the fall of Rome? Now, Callus actually mentioned something about this, so let's, let's hear what Maria Callus says. She foresee really, when she says, I foresee into the, the, uh, into the future of the Romans, and she really comes true late, later. She says, we won't destroy them. They will only be destroyed, but by their own selves. I was wondering whether this is really stalling for time or whether she really is sincere about that. I doubt. Is she that much of a philosopher? Frankly, I think it is just a woman that is frantic for time and that does not want a war to take place because she is afraid. So let's discuss this because I think this is important moving forward. She has made three distinct predictions as to the fate of Rome. One, that Rome will one day fall. 
Two, that when it does, it will not be by the hand of these Druids. Three, that if the Druids try to rebel now, they will be crushed. Of these three things, it is the truth of the last one, which is the most crucial to an interpretation of the opera. Is she correct that rebellion means certain loss? If she is correct, then her role as a policy-setting priestess has been fulfilled. Why should we care that she betrays a silly sexual rule if her governance serves the best interests of these druids? If she is incorrect, however, and knows it, then she has betrayed her leadership role, hasn't she? So as to an answer to these questions, let's have a look at some of this. She goes into these lines, these are lines trailing the, the Casta Diva aria. She says, when the angry God demands the blood of the Romans from the Druid temple, my voice will thunder forth. But as an aside to the audience, she says, but my heart could never do it. Bring back to me the beauty of our first love, then against the world itself, I will defend you. That is her talking about Polione. She's willing to defend him against the world. So she implies that the reservations of love are what hold her back, right? But what she never says is that it is outside of her power, right? She never acknowledges, this seems to be the important thing, she never acknowledges that it is outside of her power, in her opinion, to bring about a Gallic victory over the Romans. Never does she consider that something is beyond her power in this opera. But there is something else of importance here. Her betrayal is hypothetical. Consider the lines, but my heart could never do it. Against the world itself, she would defend him, and it is of him that she would make a fatherland, a patriae, and owe him loyalty over all else. So, on the surface, she's acknowledging that she is compromised, but the sentence is essentially a conditional one. Let's say you're a husband, and you say this following line, out loud, in a soliloquy, whatever, your wife and kids are not around. Let's say a husband says to himself, if there were ever an emergency, I think I would abandon my wife and kids in order to save myself. I think I'm a coward. Now that's not a good thing to say, right? However, it's a hypothetical dereliction. When the fated moment comes, that self-doubt would be made irrelevant if that is not what actually happens. And we know what is going to eventually happen. Well, because I'm going to tell you. She will not defend him in his final moments. She does not defend him against the world. She dies alongside him. Which brings us to the next scene when we get our first indication that she is a threat to the lives of her children. She says to the nurse, Vane, Eli, Chela, and Trambi, go and hide them both beyond reach. I tremble to embrace them. The next three big moments in this opera will be introduced with a trembling character. And the question is, for whom and for what do we tremble? On whose behalf are we truly fearful and for whom or for what are we allowed to be fearful? What we discuss here is really the brilliance of the librettist, the writer of the words Romani, who was indispensable to Bellini. First, with this trembling thing, Norma trembles in the presence of her children. She calls for Clotilda to take them away. Okay, so that word she uses, altre, Altre lusato, beyond reach. Put the children beyond reach. Take the children away. Altre. That these lines are important, we know, because Bellini's biographer, Herbert Weinstock, tells us that this is the opera's only leitmotif, a melody related to the idea of the children, which recurs near the end of the opera when Norma thinks of them. So Norma trembles in the presence of the children, then Adelgisa enters. In what is a very dramatic moment on the stage, we are in some suspense as the two women face each other. Norma sings to her, Tinoltra, O oh, Giovinetta, Tinoltra, come in, child, come in. Why are you trembling? Tinoltra, oh, 
I think it's great that Bellini leaves her a pause in which to notice that Adelgisa is trembling. He gives her that pause to shift from her own thoughts to concern for Adelgisa and the tone that I think Callus uses shows real empathy, a concern. She is worried for her. Listen to it. So she really is concerned for her. And this scene is an interesting inversion of the previous one. Norma had trembled in the presence of her children, fearing for what she might do. They must be taken oltre. Adalgisa must enter Tinoltra. Oltre has been turned to Tinoltra. Take them away is changed to enter. And perke, as in for what? For what are you trembling? Norma asks her. So what are our thoughts in this moment? Norma's own children are not safe in her presence. And yet haven't we just watched this character transition from a reflection on a privately, inwardly held evil intent to an outward empathy for another person? We hear it in her voice, genuine concern. For what are you trembling? But we feel bad for Norma in a sense because everybody assumes she's a much bigger bitch than she is. Adelgisa says this, but oh, look upon me without this priestly austerity which shines in your eyes. Give me courage that I may reveal my heart wholly to you. Adelgisa doesn't pick up on this empathy, even though Callus is putting it down. Adelgisa is not picking it up. People are terrified of Norma. Norma might be a little misunderstood. However, in the ensuing scene, Adelgisa reveals she has a lover, though she does not name him. And Norma, without knowing for what, forgives her and releases her from her vows in an act of charity and forgiveness. But then Polioni enters and the theme of trembling returns, transitioning us yet again in Norma's mood. First, her inward thoughts, then outward empathy, and now outright anger, which she must stifle. Realizing what has happened, Norma says to him, Tremi tu, a per qui, a per qui. You tremble for whom? For who do you tremble? The perke has been transformed into the perki. Perke, Adelgisa, for what do you tremble? Now it's to Polioni, perki, a perki, for whom do you tremble? Is what she asks Polioni. What, what are we supposed to make of all these things? So let's consider two things. As being the thing in jeopardy, the thing for which the person is trembling. The thing in jeopardy could be their soul or someone's soul as in a soul that will be damned by an evil deed in someone's eyes, or that the thing in jeopardy is a life, somebody else's life or your own life. Now, when Norma trembles for her children, does she tremble for their lives? Or does she tremble for her own soul or both? Does she tremble for their lives or for her own soul. It's to be asked. Then Adalgisa trembles. Is that for her own life or her own soul? How guilty does she think she is for this love with Polioni? But does she fear for her life anyway at the hands of the vengeful Norma? That's the other question. Then when Polioni trembles, it is a little ambiguous, isn't it? Worth Norma's questioning, who are you trembling for, you piece of crap, is kind of what she says. So let's go to this whole piece that Norma sings. And as we listen to this, returning to the brilliance of all three vital individuals, Romani, Bellini, and Callus, we can hear that Norma is struggling to pretend that she is not profoundly hurt. The music sounds like it is attempting to be carefree and yet failing with these fluctuations that feel like her voice betraying her inner pain.
So these lines are, are packed. And remember again, do we tremble for a soul or for a life? First, Norma says, don't tremble for her. She is not to blame. This line is important, and the reader, the listener, can verge down many paths. And what I mean is that it is significant that Norma, even in this love triangle, this deeply personal situation, remains the arbiter, the potentate. She is the law, both religious and political. Do not worry about her, she says to Polioni. She says this to him in her capacity as a judge. Adelgisa is not to blame in her eyes, which are also the eyes of the law. Callus pinpointed this crucial part of the opera, that Norma is always in power. But you can imagine how strong and powerful she must be to be able to dominate these people. And then she has lost her head completely. Though she does still command absolutely the power. The, uh... Norma is also disabusing him of any illusion he might have that this is an opportunity for a chivalric demonstration. You are no knight, Polioni. She is not your damsel. She is not in distress. Her life is not at risk. Dream on. You're not the hero. You're the villain. And building upon this, is she not offended, both as a person and as an absolute ruler, that he thinks she is the villain? By fearing for Adelgisa, he tacitly accuses Norma of villainy, of tyranny, the evil, jilted, envious queen of the fairy tale opposing true love. That he may harbor this sentiment, I think, irritates her, not just as a person, but as I just mentioned, as a ruler, as an arbiter of justice, how dare you, Polioni, you, a traitor, how dare you fear that an innocent life is unsafe in my power? How dare you? He has impugned the justice of the tribunal. And that sentiment is here too. And yet it is immediately contradicted by her threat on the children. How dare you fear for Adelgisa, she says. You should fear for your children, though. Those are the innocent lives I'm thinking about taking. What are we to think? How packed are these lines? That she closes with tremble for me tells us, I think, that she fears for her own soul. So it's tremble for me. You've set events in motion that put my own soul at risk through my own foreseeable deeds, right? And we should remember the melody there. Something similar to it will reappear in a purer form in the final scene. We tremble for lives, we tremble for souls, and we tremble in the presence of power. It is time to move on to the final act, act three. In this first scene, we finally see that she does not have it in her to murder her children. And her reasoning sounds more like a judge than like a human, I think. Dice sonre, for what thing? She asks herself this question, for what thing will she murder them? And a lawyer can see this word, rei, and recognize the Latin origin of a word that appears in American jurisprudence as an inheritance going back to English common law. The race, the thing, what is the deed? For what rei must the children die? It is something inhuman that stays her. Her humanity would murder the children, as in understandable human emotions would lead her down that path. The hurt of romantic betrayal. Remember these lines from Euripides, Medea, after Medea has killed the children. Jason says to her, Did you really think my marriage a good enough reason to kill them? Medea responds, Do you think that this is a small hurt for a woman? In Euripides' opinion, when an abandoned mother murders her children, this is an understandable human reaction. But with Norma, something else stops her. Something checks this human reaction. Is it her reason? Is it her obligations under the law? What is it? Is it some sense of religious metaphysical morality? What is it? Bellini. We are talking about the genius of Bellini and Romani, the play upon which this was based, the infanticide by Alexander Sumay, resulted in the murder of the children. This outcome was changed 
in this Bellini version. She makes this decision. Bellini and Romani wanted it this way. So in mentioning that this story comes from France, though, it is time to bring up a whole other concept altogether. What, if anything, is this opera saying about the French revolutionary spirit? A little historical context. This opera was first seen in December of 1831, over a year after an event in France that was called the Three Glorious Days at the end of July in 1830. The French artist Eugène Delacroix, quoted by Bartolomé Jobert, wrote this to his nephew in August of 1830. What do you think of these events? For three days, we have been in the middle of shooting and gunshots, for there is fighting everywhere. The simple pedestrian like me has exactly as much chance of being shot, neither more nor less, as these improvised heroes who march against the enemy with bits of iron attached to a broomstick handle. Up to now, things are going the best way possible. Everybody who has any sense hopes that the promoters of the Republic will agree to stand at ease. This is the same Eugene Delacroix, who in the fall of 1830, during these events, would paint the most iconic image of the French revolutionary spirit, liberty leading the people. And yet here he is. Look at these words. When we hear Delacroix describing these broomstick handles, do we think of the lines from the beginning of Norma? This is what she had said to the Druids, making reference to their inferior weapons. She dominates these, uh, shall we say, cavemen, which not exactly are cavemen, they're really savage, uh, people ferocious, that are people. ferocious people that are against the Romans, they are rearing to go, really. I think Callus's interpretation of that is correct as to Norma's feelings. Does that agree with what Bellini's saying? I think that's open to interpretation. Bellini's depiction of these druids is very interesting. If she wants to call them savages, that's fine. They do what they're told. Another person might call that submission to the rule of law. And when a people submits to the rule of law, we don't call that savagery. We call that civilization. Their leader says, we're not going to war, and they obey even though they want to go to war. That's called civilization. That's called submission to the rule of law. When she is finally jilted enough that she wants to inspire them to go to war, they do not unequivocally jump into it. They do have this very interesting moment where they question it. You just told us we should be at peace. They do question it. There's a moment of pause. These druids, at least in my opinion, are not a caricature of an idiotic multitude. Which means that to the extent that Bellini and Romani are making a commentary upon the French revolutionary spirit, it must necessarily be a complex one. This is a complex opera that can lead us down any number of paths and disagree on any number of counts. Regarding the evolving interpretation of opera that even one individual can have, Callus refers to here. And it's not done in one day, it's not done in one week, and in fact, I don't think it's ever finished because a com uh, uh, an interpreter grows each year. Having broke this down, broken this down completely, then you can take wings. So let's get this battle hymn, which does sound quite hostile. So there's that. All I kind of want to ask here, though, is what does a war hymn for a just cause sound like? 
it's just a question. And what I think is interesting, though, is that once it's over, they revert back to that sound of veneration as they ask who the sacrificial victim is going to be. And of course, that sounds quite barbaric. It is quite barbaric. But is this as close as we get to a true spot on criticism of the French revolutionary spirit when Norma says, Norma says these words. The altar has never lacked for victims, sacrificial victims. Is this a direct shot at the French revolutionary spirit? Is this a shot at the French Revolution, which certainly never lacked for victims, bystanders, indifferent people, people who didn't care, had their heads chopped off during the reign of terror? And are we not reminded of this with the words of Delacroix saying that you have the same chance exactly of being killed in the vengeance of revolution? whether you are part of it or not. Well, here we go. A random victim must be chosen. But all this being said about these druids, what are we to make of this moment later on? So I'm going to have to tell this end out of order in order so that I'm thematically coherent here. After she admits her own betrayal, that she has betrayed them with Polioni, and that will mean her own death. She orders the fire to be prepared. She orders the fire to be prepared. She and Polioni will die. The children will be spared. Adelgisa's guilt is never known. And like Calla says, even in the order for her own death, she's in control. She's in power. She orders her own death. No one forces her abdication. She does everything herself. But in this moment when she reveals that she is a betrayer of trust, there's not this instant outrage from these druids. She really breaks their hearts. They are stunned in silence. They question it. They give her an opportunity to refute her own confession. Like we had said, are these people civilized? So let's hear the stunned silence following this confession while also enjoying some of the drama leading up to it. So we can hear their muted disbelief. But what they say next, the words that come from the chorus, are interesting from Romani. They say the words, I am frozen with horror. They use the singular. Each of them is an individual reacting to this. Each of them has been individually betrayed by her. They're not a mass all thinking alike. She has broken their hearts singularly. Are we not allowed to ask if these supposedly bloodthirsty, warlike druids are not every bit as misunderstood as Norma herself. Norma, presumed to be vengeful, irate and incapable of reason by those closest to her, by Adelgisa, 
by Polione. Are the Druids entitled to a same re-examination just because they get fired up and they sing that war hymn? Are they not entitled to that outburst just like Norma is as an individual? When they ask her later whether or not she really is guilty, she responds with a reference back to a concept way back at the beginning, the idea of a thing being beyond human power. Yes, she says, she is guilty beyond human power to know. So that theme is reintroduced. So let's close this out. Of all the themes we've mentioned, the most crucial one is that she rejects this impulse to murder her children. And in the last lines, she implores that Orvieso spare them. And these are, these are the lines. So I have to cut that off. The whole ending is obviously worth listening to. The whole opera is worth listening to, worth reading the libretto, deciding your favorite moments, deciding your opinions about it. But even in this ending, I think this ending musically conveys more than anything else, depth. Depth of meaning. Depth of personal consideration and profound feelings. Now, a lot of operas attempt that. So it's just for our taste to decide whether or not this one is superior to many others. But Callus thought so, and that is why it is the subject of this video. The legacy of Bellini's Norma is partly hers. Yeah.